Are you having fun? Yay. Can you, can you guys hear in the cool. back? Testing, testing. All right, let's get some audience participation. Everybody on the right, you're Aussies. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. Everybody on the left, Kiwi, Kiwi, Kiwi. Come on, you're, you're New Zealanders. You're supposed to put the Aussies to shame. All right, just want to make sure you're awake. Uh, my talk's about security. Uh, that's my real name, Craig Cunningham. I'm just an IT generalist. Um, I've been around this area for a long time. I programmed in Motorola 68,000 assembler language, COBOL in high school, if that gives you any idea how old I am. Um, I'm unfortunately not a security ninja, and some of you might have come to see a security ninja, but I know the fundamentals pretty well. In other words, if I need to get something done, I can generally find the tool and get the work done. So when I originally made this talk, I said, well, I'm going to talk about how to protect yourself. And then I said, well, I have a 25-minute slot. That's not going to work. <laughs> and so I worked on it, and I worked on it. I finally realized nothing I could tell you from a technical standpoint could fully protect you. But from a legal standpoint, from a moral argument standpoint, maybe we can reframe the argument so we don't have to protect ourselves so much. And that's what my talk is. I hope that I can prove that to you. All right, so the government comes out and they talk to you and they say, hey, you need uh, to give up a little of your privacy for security. It's a zero-sum game. You know, that's the claim. They also claim, you know, the government's here to help you. You know, that's the classic thing that you know you're in trouble when someone says, oh, we're here to help you. We're the police. You're like, oh, shit, I know things have gone sideways now. Uh, so my comment related to this is this right here. Everything above that line is absolute bullshit. In other words, security can't exist without privacy because privacy is part of security. If you take any low-level cert, you know, Security Plus, the first thing they do is introduce you to the CIA triangle. And they say, hey, it's confidentiality, integrity, availability. Well, when you take my privacy away, you destroy confidentiality. When you put malware on my systems and destroy my process integrity, you destroy that in the eye. Availability. I'm willing to bet there's a chance that if the, the fiber splitters in the AT&T room dropped out, they'd tell AT&T you need to, to stop this circuit for a while until we can install some new cards because we need to monitor everything. In other words, availability can be impacted by people trying to spy on you. All right, so if you are a wise rabbit, one of the things you do is you turn Bluetooth off. You turn location services off. I saw a guy yesterday in a talk, and he said, I have seven laptops with me and a Raspberry Pi. He said, I wipe one completely after each day, and I download only the data to like some kind of SIM card to his Raspberry Pi. He's like, as long as they don't find the Raspberry Pi, I think I'm good. And I was like, man, that, that's a stream. You know, like, I'm not screwing around with that guy. Uh, I mean, I own a black phone, too, and I'm not, I'm not near that guy. All right, so is the rabbit wise? That's the question. Well, the wolf thinks so. The fox, sorry. So th there are predators out there, you know, whether they be government people abusing their power, whether they be nation states, hackers, they want to steal your information. You know, they want, they want to use your PC. You know, Krebs on security does these things. You know, the value of a hacked PC, the value of a hacked email account. Um, this predator is out there, and you should know it. During, I saw something on television last night, and it changed my thought on this talk right here. It was about the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And what that was is they went in and dressed as police officers to all these gang members, and they got them to line up against the wall, and then they killed them all. Well, would those guys have lined up against the wall if the competing gang had come in? Hell no. They were taught, you have to respond this way to the government. And when the government accosts you and tells you to give up all your weapons and stand against the wall, you do so. Because otherwise, it's going to be more trouble for you. Well, in that case, they all end up dead. Because they made no effort to protect themselves. They were under the assumption. Like in V for Vendetta, you know, the finger men pull her aside. You know, she has no power. They have total power, therefore they tend to abuse it. All right, so let's say I am the rabbit and I start using some anonymization tools to protect my data from being captured. Well, I get on a special list. This guy uses Tor. This guy uses VPN. Uh, he encrypts data. In 2013, I traveled across the Canadian border and I looked up all the restrictions that might relate to me. Well, one of them said, on the U.S. side of customs, if you have any encrypted data, the U.S. government has the right to make a copy of it and keep it forever. I think they modified that to five years recently, but forever. 
their philosophy was, if you've encrypted it, it's suspicious, and we should keep a copy of it. Because it's private to me doesn't mean it should be suspicious to my government. But we've got lots of government programs. Bull Run, that's all about making sure that we have back doors. We have a way into your system. Once we have a way in our system, we gather all data possible. Key score. You know, Snowden talks about key score. He says, or X key score. He says, look, I can look up anything. I just put in your email address, I put in your IP address, something about you, and I can gather all the information about you. That was what Clapper was talking about when he talked about if I go upstream, I will violate your privacy rights. He doesn't say there's anything wrong with collecting it. He uses a different term. We'll get to that in a minute. And this is the goat seeing you. That's the only goatsy reference you get in this talk, sorry. But the goat seeing you. All right, so they had egotistical giraffe and egotistical goat. That's basically saying if you're using Tor, you're not safe. We're going to go after you. And if you're so egotistical to think that that's going to protect your privacy, you're dumb. You've made a mistake. All right, so if that doesn't work, we can install malware that will exist in your system no matter what you do. Stutnex, firmware virus, Seagate, Western Digital, all these companies have been affected. So this is an irate monk. I'm not really familiar with this uh, term very much, but I do know that I've seen a piece of firmware virus. I, I don't know what it was. I don't know what it's flame, Stutnex, but I was working in an industrial environment. We had a machine that had an odd behavior. We wiped it completely, still had the odd behavior. We set up another machine just like it, put it back in place, no odd behavior. Set that one up in a test lab with test equipment on it, same odd behavior. I said, hey, boss, this is really cool. Like, we've got something very interesting here. I think we have a bias virus, let's investigate. He's a pragmatic guy. He said, pull some chips off that board, throw it in the melt barrel, and get back to work. You know, we as normal citizens do not have the resources to compete with this level of attack. So we need our laws and our philosophical debates to protect us from this. So why have I said I'm so distrustful of the government? One of the reasons is right here. The Supreme Court Justice ha had a case where two women were abused in their own home. They had called the police. The police had come by. They'd never come into the home. They'd never like, knocked on the door and actually gotten a response. And they sued. And the Supreme Court says, the police do not have a responsibility to you. They have a responsibility to society. So the NSA, the CIA, all the three-letter acronyms are defining security for you. We will defend your general security rights as we define those words. And currently, they're defining them in a lot of secret rooms behind locked doors. I mentioned, you know, on the way here, how many people did this on the way here? A decent number, you know. Is this, is this the, free, the posture of a free citizen? I don't think so. It's the same position for, hey, line up against the wall and getting shot by the St. Valentine's Massacre. You're submitting yourself. You're saying, hey, I'm completely submissive, I have nothing in my pockets, inspect me. If I tell you that I believe that privacy, confidentiality, is part of security, then I, my security has been lost at this moment, just passing through the airport. But they're doing this to protect me. When they, when they do actual pen test of these, they evaluate the effectiveness of TSA, it doesn't usually go very well. 47% uh, of Americans hacked in the last three years, you know, victims of some kind of breach. We're not doing very well on this. False choices. So I was teaching a class really recently. I teach some certification classes. I teach CISP, and I had an NSA guy in my class. And I'm a little bit of a privacy advocate, and he's a little bit of not a privacy advocate. <laughs> and so we had some heated discussions. And one day he asked me this stupid question, and I kind of really resented it at the time. But now I'm glad he asked me, so I can give it to you in this talk. He said, would you rather the U.S. spy on everyone on the planet or no one? And I said, well, if you're going to put me in shitty situation number one or shitty situation number two, I prefer the one that costs no resources. And he didn't ask me any more questions or make any other arguments <laughs> during that <laughs> section of class. In other words, he, he thought he'd back me in the corner because he has learned to define the conversation before we enter the conversation. It's, Clapper recently was accused of, saying some incorrect things in court, I mean, in front of Congress, which he did. And he said, well, it was a loaded question. It was like saying, when are you going to quit beating your wife? Well, they do that. The government does that to us all the time. They called, muni they called encryption a munition so that all the laws relating to encryption would uh, relate to that. They threw Phil Zimmerman in jail because he wouldn't give him the back door. When he wrote PGP, they said, give us the back door. Give us the back door key. And he said, there is none. And they couldn't fathom that. 
In other words, they're like, no one writes encryption without giving themselves a back door. He's like, no, really, there's no back door. They said, well, you will put out an update, and you will put a back door in the update. And he said, no. And they said, well, we have this really comfy prison cell. Why don't you sit in it for a while and see if you change your mind? This is the U.S. government, what we have done. I believe that privacy is part of security. The U.N. agrees with me. The metadata argument, it comes up all the time. Oh, we're not listening to your conversations. We might have them, but we're mainly concerned about your metadata. All right, this is a kind of heavy eye test uh, slide, I admit. But even when psychologists are talking about what you need as a human being, they start off with your physical needs. I, I do like the fact that they include sex, food, water, shelter, and sex. I mean, if they threw alcohol up in there, you know, I, I'd be great. All right, and then they say your security needs. Needs for control over your own environment, order, a safe place, financial security, all right? People check your bank records. They invalidate your passwords. They invalidate SSL, TLS. Physical safety, they know where I am at all times. That data is loose. AT&T's got it, Verizon's got it. When you go on your phone and it says, uh, you know, you're here, how does it figure that out? Well, Google has a list of every Wi-Fi they've ever picked up. And so if they're picking up three Wi-Fi's at these faint strengths, they geolocate you off those three Wi-Fi's. They know exactly where you are, and we're giving that data out. Now, the government claims if you gave that data to a third party, pretty much they have a right to it. You gave it away, so, you know, you shouldn't have. I'd say, no, I have a relationship with Google. I am getting some services from them. They are monetizing me in the ways that I understand, or vaguely understand. That is at least a relationship. For you to come as a third party and say, we deserve the right to all that data is, again, my second slide, bullshit. All right, so then we get to this third level, friendship, enemies, family. Can you have any of these things without privacy? How many families, you know, spill all their garbage on the front lawn? Okay, okay, a, cu a couple of you, I know. <laughs> yeah, I've, seen, I, I've seen those, uh, a couple of those daytime TV shows. But most of us want intimacy. We want tightness. We want friendship. We want our friends to know more about us than anyone else knows. We want to feel comfortable that if I make an inside joke, my friend gets it and no one else does because I have shared time with that person. All right, so we move up the chain. Let's say if we haven't recognized that our friendship, intimacy, family is messed up, self-esteem, personal worth, social recognition, accomplishments. Well, the government says, well, we need to know all about that too. Well, wait a second, social recognition, you're a member of B-Sides? Oh, psh, EFF? That's some sketchy organizations, you know. We need to put you on a special list. Most of us don't make it probably to this level for the most part. I admit, if you, make it, if you look up here, it says, once you get to that level, you don't care too much about the opinion of others. Maybe that would make us friendlier to people spying on our privacy. I'm probably somewhere in here. And speaking of that, I need my alcohol from up there. All right. So back in 1700s, 1800s, uh, Bentham here, he designed a prison. People say a panopticon or panoptimism, and they're saying the whole design of this prison is that one guard would stand up here behind like mirrored glass or something, in other words, no one would know when he or she was looking out, and all the prisoners would be here. So every prisoner would say, have to say, I may not be being watched, but I could be being watched right now. Therefore, I will alter you know, what I do. That was the whole idea of this. He said, a new mode of uh, obtaining power of the, mind, uh, of the mind, over the mind, and a quantity here to without example. He is claiming this is a better idea to manipulate people's minds than has ever been around before. Well, this was a prison. This was for milling, grinding people down mentally. And we are asked to accept that the NSA will take all our data and watch us at all times. Well, this right here, a short review for decoration. Most of you probably already knew this. If you read Glenn, uh, uh, Greenwald's book, stuff like this. But you might not know about this. The same guy who designed this prison, when we had the US Declaration of Independence, he wrote a short review mocking it, mocking the view of our style of government, that we could have a democracy, that we could be separate from them, that we thought normal people you know, had a, a reasonable say. In other words, this is a guy who was so against our way of life. You know, he was an elite. Elites should be able to do what they want with the serfs. 
All right, Heisenberg's principle, most of you realize, or think of that meaning, if you watch something, you change it. Technically, it's the uncertainty principle. I figured someone might scream at me if I didn't put, point that out. But we say if we look at a system, we change it. Quantum cryptography works this way. If I pass data from, from Alice to Bob, and anyone intercepts it, Evil Eve even looks at those photons, we can tell. So we, we can tell if someone looked at something. We are using this principle to guard ourselves with the type of quantum computing that we know we have now. If the NSA has got something fancier, you know, don't tell me because I don't want to be black bagged. All right, Feynman. Feynman said, hey, no, this is not so true. And Feynman was a genius, in my opinion. All right, he said, nature doesn't give a damn whether you're looking or not. Well, I assure you there's been many studies that I cannot cover in this 25 minutes that I can assure you that most of us act differently when we're being watched. If we're being recorded, we act a lot differently. All right, cost of securities. All right, some of you see this and they say, all right, I can understand the first, uh, you know, first Amendment, right to speech, right to associate. In other words, if I'm tracking everyone you associate with, I'm looking at the metadata of what cell phone was in that bar when Greg was in there? You know, what cell phone was in that bar when Craig was in there? Oh, they were in there together once per month. What other cell phones? We think they're nefarious characters. All right, Second Amendment. How is that related? We currently have the right to guns, or at least some people believe so. Well, the Supreme Court has ruled that there can't be a registry of that. In other words, they cannot demand to register those things. Well, if you have all information, you violate the second. What's the Third Amendment? Anyone know? Not very much talked about anymore. It said we can't put a soldier in your house. Well, they weren't so concerned about feeding the soldier. They were concerned about that soldier having some administrative control or violating their privacy at all times. If I want to control my subjects, I put soldiers in all their homes who watch what they do and report in. Well, what the hell's malware on my router? It's a soldier in my home. Who's paying the electricity to run him? I am. Who's paying the air conditioning to, to cool that? I am. They're putting someone watching me in my home. I, we, if we're going to fight for privacy, we can't only fight on the Fourth Amendment that says we should be secure in our papers and our homes and ourselves. We have to use every amendment we have because they're going to use every secret ruling they have. The Ninth Amendment. The Ninth Amendment says there are inalienable rights that are not defined in the Constitution. In other words, it is not, we are not wise enough men, at that time they were all men, to put in everything we should enumerate that is an inalienable right. There are certain things that we just can't list here, but that does not mean that they should not be protected. So I would say privacy might insert very well right there in the Ninth Amendment. We should be assured some level of privacy. All right, uh, 14th Amendment, um, due process. There are lots of cases right now that are coming up in courts uh, Rand Paul was talking about one recently. The DEA was getting all these tips, and they were busting people off these tips. But when it went to court, they would make up some other story about where they got the news. So the defense lawyer now has a false story which to glom onto and make his defense or her defense. And so they're living off a fallacy. So when that person goes to prison, are we surprised? They didn't have all the information about the court. Due process is being just junk thrown out. All right, the 21st, one of my favorite, we can drink booze. When they shut down, when, when Prohibition came about, Einstein said, it's such a shame that we're shutting down all the uh, speaking houses. Why? Because booze was important. Everyone sat around, they drank booze, and they chatted. They did their political debates there. That's where they talked. Well, what are we doing now? We talk on the internet, and we're shutting it down. We're saying, if you search on these terms, you might be suspected of something. If you're in these chat rooms with these particular people, you might be suspected of something. So I think the 21st Amendment comes around. In other words, it's the exact kind of thing where Einstein said, if we restrict where people meet and where people chat, we will suffer as a society. Toxic data, if you haven't already read it, you should read Bruce Schneier's article about the toxicity of data. For decades, we've been saying, hey, hard drives are cheaper, let's save everything, We'll use data mining to figure out cool, you know, high relational rare events that will te teach us stuff. Well, IBM Watson did that. It taught us a way to use viruses to cure cancer. Very rare 
but um, obvious things uh, to a computer, not obvious to us. But we haven't learned that having data can cost us money. If you get sued and you've got 10 years worth of uh, emails, you will pay a lawyer hundreds of dollars an hour to go through all those emails. Maybe it's better to say, well, after five years, we just get rid of emails. It doesn't mean you're any more guilty. It just means that there's a level at which keeping that data is wrong. So I mentioned foreign here. Let's say uh, a new dictator comes about in whatever country, and that dictator is trying to cozy up to the United States, the United States is trying to cozy up to them, get oil rights or uranium rights or whatever, and they say, hey, there's some people we don't like in our company and country, and we know you have data about them. Please give us this data. The NSA can't say they don't have it. It's obvious they're collecting data on about everyone. I would rather our government be able to say we don't keep that kind of data. Otherwise, we're going to have to bend to that tyrant and give them that information if we want to cooperate in that country. All right, so basically this, is, this was our Bill of Rights, but we're allowing courts to, to override it. What are we allowing? We're allowing surveillance. We're assuming we are surveilled and that we can do nothing about that. I would like every one of you to make some small attempt over the next day, the next week, the next year to resist assuming surveillance is going to happen and it's okay. Or else we'll end up with this. And then eventually you'll say, well, that's okay. We're safe. They promised us if we let them have all this data, we'd be secure. Well, this is the phrase I want to coin today. If it's already been used by someone, I apologize. It's the Hindenburg Principle. It's when you know that you're safe and good, everything's going great, and one day something sets your ass on fire. You've assumed that the government is keeping you safe. You've assumed that surveillance will negatively, never negatively affect you. The Hindenburg Principle. All right, so the next argument that always comes up is that if I don't have anything to hide, I don't need to worry about government surveillance. I have not found the rock solid um, argument for this. I found many good arguments against it, but I haven't found the rock solid. I thought this guy did a really good job, Terry Adams. He's saying the way our state was developed, everything in government was supposed to be public, and everything in your lives was supposed to be private. We even have these terms, public meetings, private meetings. Well, now what is the government telling us? They're telling us this should be the opposite. How, how many decades in the future will it be before you get someone appointed to the Supreme Court and they wear a mask like a SWAT team member. I don't want to see that. I'm not saying that's coming. I'm just saying that's an extreme example to get you to think about what we need to resist. You can actually look up who's on the FISA court. You just can't look up much else about the FISA court. All right, everything's got something to hide. This is a very famous statement by probably a very corrupt man because you couldn't really become a head honcho at that time without being a very corrupt man and in with the system. But the importance of this statement about the six lines is not that he had the intelligence to find something bad, it's he knew the courts were corrupt enough that if he accused you of something bad, you'd be found guilty of it. This, this is a, sorry, this is a combination of the system, not necessarily a, a single person. All right, Supreme Court Justice, I'm running out of time here, so I'm gonna rush this a little bit. Basically, this, this same article, um, Breyer, they referenced a federal law about the size of lobster tails. They said, do you know that you could be arrested for having a lobster tail under a certain size? So it doesn't matter whether you bought it in a supermarket, whether it was served to you in a restaurant, whether you found it alive or dead, whether you killed it in self-defense, my favorite part. <laughs> but you could be accused of a federal crime. This is a Supreme Court justice of the United States warning us that the law is too damn confusing. All right. When the wall came down, there were potentially up to like 500,000 is about the top number of informants in East Germany. And they said, we have all this data from all these informants. What do we do with it? And a lot of people said, let's open up the data and just let everyone know everything. And they were like, should the data be open or closed? And I thought this guy said something kind of funny, and I wanted to share it with you guys. There's only two innocent groups, the newborn and the alcoholic, and I'm working on that. But they, they decided to keep those files closed because they thought it would be a travesty. There would be reprisals. There would be problems. There would be people who cheated on their wives. And, and all this information would hit their society at once, and it would potentially destroy their society. Big Brother, Big Data, 
I found this through an article about Snowden, but the guys from Yale should really get a credit for this. They said basically, every time Moore's Law helps us uh, double our, our power, our computing power get cheaper, our, our civil rights will be violated. And so every time we need to reevaluate what controls we have in place to make sure that our civil rights are not being violated by that increase in technology. All right, so getting to the opaque, anonymous attempts to be very opaque, forces that might help us but we can't control. What else is opaque? Almost opaque as a as a court. I am not suicidal. Just for the reference, just anyone knows? I'd like to put that out there. I mentioned uh, in another talk I went to this week, I said, hey, if you went around talking like uh, Thomas Jefferson, they'd lock you up. You'd definitely get on a list. Well, this is the stamp from his, uh, his statement, but this is the full statement, and that's on the memorial. I mean, this is not something that I didn't verify that he said. They're trying to prevent tyrancy. What do we have? We have tyrancy. We have the ability for the government to come in, put malware wherever the hell they want, and watch you. Here's the soldier in my house. All right. In, if you haven't read this book, it's an interesting book. It's an old book, so it's not up on technology, but it's an interesting book. And in the end, they convicted this guy of stealing electricity. Years and years ago, when hackers got busted for breaking into banks and they couldn't find them guilty on any of the laws currently, they would bust them for stealing electricity. I think if they can do that, then I should be able to bust the feds for putting malware on a system. All right, here's our, uh, our group, Clapper, uh, Keith, <laughs> and uh, they're, I refer to this as English because they tend to define words differently than we do. They have the word collection, which means whatever we keep, we didn't really collect. Only when we read it did we collect it. That's their terminology. The government is allowing themselves to redefine our language so they can do whatever the hell they want. They can justify it in their court if we let them re-engineer the English language. Maybe we should have a law that says whenever something's justified with a new interpretation that doesn't match Webster's, it has to be announced. All right, Senator Feinstein finds out the CIA is hacking into their um, area, and all she wants is an apology. I stole this from Lisa Lorenzen because it was so damn good. This is what we need to say when they do this. All right, I, it looks like I have no time left. So what to stop doing? Don't run any scripting. Don't buy into the cloud if these companies aren't going to guarantee you some security. Don't use IPv6 unless you understand IPv6. If you don't know whether you're using it, then you are. Go turn it off. Don't leak DNS. Leak DNS. You know, use good VPNs. Ask your VPN providers. Use encryption. Um, Steve Gibson, you know, encrypt things before they go to the internet. Um, check out your fingerprints. Go to EFF. This will tell you how unique your browser is in the world. At one time, mine was one in nine million. That's pretty unique, you know. All right, what can you do? Hold disk encryption, lock down your firmware, make sure your vendors are signing your firmware to, to where at least they have to be compromised for your firmware to be replaced. Shout out, I want everyone to move to HTTPS. Berners-Lee actually says no. Let's raise the entire bar of HTTP to be secure rather than just doing HTTPS. Either one is good for me. What to avoid? Anything new the government throws out there. You know, should we have a right to take DNA, take tattoos, take pictures of people who have not been convicted and put them in national databases and then later look and say, well, we got someone guilty of a crime and they, and they look kind of like this. Uh, let's bring that person in. They weren't guilty when they got first arrested and now they're considered possibly guilty. Real change, we're only going to do that by things that really matter, not the technology itself, going to our leaders, educating them, reversing the Patriot Act as best we can, bailment. Bailment means I own data about me. If you have it, you can only use it in ways that I opt in. Quit spying on the whole world and pissing everyone off. We'll have less terrorists that way. And everyone, please smile because you're probably on someone's camera and it'll make you seem a little less threatening. Shout out page. Actually, someone might be here from this. B sides for letting me talk. Chris Payne for being my mentor. EFF, I encourage all of you to, uh, to uh, join, give money. By the way, will you go ahead and pass out those? Uh, I bought you guys all some raffle tickets. 
So the money would go to B-Sides, EFF. Um, just pass those out any way you want. Take one. All right, thanks for Lisa Lorenzen. She gave some great, great uh, talks. Moxie, I've actually never met, but I like his work. Um, Bruce Schneier, Chris, Zaz. If you haven't watched Zaz's video on uh, Do Not Fuck Up, you absolutely should. This runs on metadata. So it's something we should be concerned about. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Craig. Thank you so much. It looks like I'm out of time, so I'll take any questions you have and back in the corner away from everyone.